Call this public hearing of the Senate Communications and Technology Committee and the House State Government Committee Subcommittee on Government Operations to order. Today's hearing is to receive testimony on what blockchain technology is and how it impacts state government operations. The world of technology is changing rapidly and state government must keep up in order to effectively create policy that reflects the changing times. This is a topic that is new to many of us and hopefully it will create a larger conversation on the inclusion of new technologies within our state government. I'd like to welcome all members of both committees and would like to start with a few housekeeping items. We do have a few members who are participating virtually. Uh, for those participating virtually, if you could make sure that your microphone is on mute and your phone is silent so we don't hear any background noise, we'd really appreciate it. Additionally, if you have a question, please use the hand raising feature on Zoom and we will recognize you to speak. I'd like to start with member introductions, beginning with the gentleman from Lebanon County, I'm Representative Frank Ryan, and apparently I must be operating remotely since I'm that much distant from the rest of the committee. Good morning, State Senator Kristen Phillips Hill, 28th District, York County. Representative Jason Ortitai, 46th District, Allegheny and Washington Counties. Brett Miller, State Representative, 41st District, Lancaster County. State Representative Seth Grove, Senator Kristen Phillips Hill, driver, and also pick up a dry cleaning. York <laughs> County, 196th District. Thanks for having me. It's going to be that kind of hearing, I can tell. <laughs> Representative Clint Alwitt, uh, Tioga, Bradford, and Potter County. Thank you. Oh, if only that were true. So I would now. Oh. Good morning, everybody. Representative Ben Sanchez from Montgomery County. And, and hi, it's Christine Howard from Chester County. Thank you, Representative Howard. Um, I would now like to turn it over to our testifier for this morning, Mr. William Price, attorney at Clark Hill. And Mr. Price, you can proceed whenever you are ready. That better? Yeah. Good morning. Uh, William Price. Uh, I do work at Clark Hill uh, PLC, it's a law firm, uh, international law firm, uh, with offices both in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and within the Commonwealth. Uh, I work out of the Pittsburgh office. Um, I also, and much more of my uh, testimony today will be related to my role at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. I've been an adjunct professor for uh, 10 years now. Uh, I've just recently re-upped for another four-year uh, stretch teaching the course uh, Secure Transactions, which centers on the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, my testimony today is, is, is purely in my, my personal observations. It's not to be reflected by my law firm or the, or the law school, um, but I'm, I'm very appreciative of being able to present today and uh, answer any questions that I'm capable of answering. Um, it's, it's pretty wonderful to ask for a meeting with your local representative, get that meeting for you know, 15, 20 minutes, talk about a topic that is not greatly understood yet by most uh, politicians, and then turn into a hearing relatively quickly. So I, I really appreciate your time. And I think it's an important issue that could take months or even years uh, to become a reality for the Commonwealth to utilize the technology, um, but it starts with something like this, with a hearing. So I provided a written statement in advance. Uh, I'm happy to read it into the record if that is helpful, or I'm happy to just reference it during my discussion. With that statement, I provided a, a variety of links that I think are very helpful uh, for a preliminary review of blockchain te technology. Uh, I provided a nuts and bolts link that really explains what it is that we're talking about. And I provided some law review articles specifically on the system that I uh, can speak to, which is the Uniform Commercial Code filing system, uh, as to why and how it would actually be a better system utilizing the blockchain technology and the smart contracts that are now utilized on blockchain technology. Um, I am not an expert on blockchain technology. I've been reviewing it for about a year. 
Uh, I've, I find it interesting specifically for the UCC filing system. It's my personal belief that this should be a conversion for all 50 states uh, to go to blockchain technology to use the smart contracts that I discussed in my statement. Um, the reason being is that it's a very basic system. It's, it's a database that has you know, a limited number of fields that are necessary to file the documents. And it should be quickly, easily scanned. It should be easy to search. And it should be also easy for parties to renew their filings, which are required under the code between a window of six months at the tail end of their five-year period, um, which all could be automated. Um, while I say in my statement that I'm not going to discuss cryptocurrency specifically all that much unless you really want to talk about it, um, there are tokens that can be created that are utilized for credits, a credit system so somebody could preload their filing and automatically renew within five years to have an extended period of time. And most lending facilities anymore have a relationship longer than five years. So it's, it's just those basic things that could be done much more e easily on the blockchain technology. And because it's so public and transparent and easily reviewable, um, it's not a very complicated system to be able to keep up to speed on where things stand. Um, so for example, if you are um, PNC Bank, they can easily scan on a blockchain much quick, more quickly an output that says, here are all your filings, here's when they're due, here's when they lapse, here's how you renew them. Um, and with blockchain technology, you can put uh, pivots in those contracts and just say, well, at four years, six months, and a day, we want to automatically renew. Um, the most notable pitfall was in the General Motors bankruptcy where there was a billion dollar miss on a renewal. So a bank lost a billion dollar position, their secured status in, a, in the General Motors bankruptcy. So there are practical issues that arise by virtue of the, the nature of having to take an overt act to renew these contracts when the contracts between the parties was expected to be an automatic renewal when it comes through. So that's, those are some things I'd like to talk about. I'm open to any questions, and uh, if there's any specific questions in the statement or things that you've done in your own investigation, I'm happy to address them. Thank you very much, Mr. Price. I'd like to recognize that we are now joined with the Senate Communications and Technology Committee Minority Chair, uh, Senator Kane. And I would like to turn it over to uh, Chairman Ortitai for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Price, for being here. It's good to see you outside of the district. Thank you. Uh, you know, for the benefit of everyone here and everyone watching at home uh, live, mainly probably just my mom, um, it, could you just go over what, what uh, basically what blockchain technology is at its basic level? Sure. Um, so a, a blockchain technology is, um, there are, they're referred to as platforms or chains. Um, there are different parties that have created them. Uh, in my summary, I, I mentioned specifically Algorand, and the only reason I mentioned that one is because I've become personally familiar with it. Um, there, a blockchain is a, um, a block, is a, 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 a sequence of, of information that is memorialized permanently on the chain. So it's, it's akin to a database that could be centralized, a mainframe technology, for example, where, you know, like Oracle, those types of, of systems where you create these databases that you put information to. A blockchain um, has a continuous register of information that gets validated and that there are, there are different ways of creating it. Um, but typically, you would have somebody creates this, this block that they want to add to the chain, and then there's a process whereby that block becomes permanent, and there are different types of systems that are um, centralized or decentralized. Centralized means that there's a, a, a third party with monitoring that, that controls the system. Decentralized means that there are numerous parties that basically just validate the process and ensure that the block becomes permanent in a record. So why does it matter? Who cares? Well, that permanent blockchain as it becomes permanent and, and adds layers and layers and layers to it, the information is available permanently. You can, you can see it, you can scan it. And it, there are programming languages. So in, with Algorand, they use um, uh, Python and some other languages that, that go ahead and search the database and give outputs. Outputs that are very inexpensive for anybody to download the, the mechanism to search the blockchain and have a full scan of the blockchain very, very quickly, very efficiently. And so when you have a blockchain, you have two different types of, of items on the blockchain. You have fungible ones that look and act and feel, but there's many of them issued. So you have a, a cryptocurrency, for example. So people are very familiar with uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, and, and Algorand has their own native, native token called Algo. 
So that's, that looks, acts, and feels the same again and again and again. It just sits on the blockchain, and, and it, the blockchain shows which account is associated with which number of those tokens. A non-fungible token, is an NFT, which a lot of people associate with images or, or pictures, that's, in my view, the least important aspect of an NFT. An NFT is a non-fungible, meaning that it's, it, there's one of it permanently. And so it provides you with a, a roster of data that's scannable on a public blockchain, that's searchable by anybody, shows who owns it, which account it's associated with, and provides permanent information that, show, that cannot be modified generally, that shows, okay, this NFT has these following qualities, has this information associated with it. So for example, it could be a mortgage document, it could be a UCC filing, it could be any number of information that could have a digital image, it could have a song associated with it, any number of things, qualities. So when you have this blockchain, it creates this massive database quickly that everybody in the world has access to and can see. Now there's also private blockchains that can be, that can be designed and implemented for a private organization. So if the state or Commonwealth has concerns about security, or how does anybody have access to the information of the blockchain? It doesn't have to be publicized. It could be a, a blockchain that's privately driven. But it's, it's really just a very simple format of a database that is easily reviewable and has you know, the ones and zeros again and again and again and again that shows a permanent register of a piece of information. Thank you for that. If you could, I'll just ask one more question and then I'll turn it back over to you. Um, it, you had mentioned the UCC filing system in your written testimony. Mm -hmm. Could you just walk through an example of what that would look like with, sure. with the blockchain technology? Absolutely. So <clears throat> the UCC system is a very basic system. It, it, it is um, statutorily, it provides a lender with the right to provide public notice that they have a lending relationship with a borrower. So it says, the name of the debtor, the name of the lender, it has a, uh, it, you have to indicate the type of collateral, you can say all assets, you can describe you know, equipment, inventory, et cetera. All those fields get populated. There's a mandatory form that this state requires in order to send it off to the Secretary of State who's the designated register of the information. And so right now, Every UCC system in the country is run through a centralized mainframe database that says, okay, what's the name of the debtor? What's the name of the lender? What's the address of the debtor? What's the address of the lender? All that information gets put into a system that gets maintained on technology that runs, that was invented 50 years plus ago. And it's, it works. The, pro the project works. It, it, it's, it's effective in, in doing what it needs to do. Nobody has filed lawsuits saying that the UCC system is, is ineffective or not registering the information or not available. Um, every state in the union has a different process whereby you can search the, the database. You, there's different search logic. There's different, um, you know, what, what output matters as to whether or not you've given proper notice to the world. And so the, the power of the UCC filing is that you are given a perfected status in certain types of collateral against other, bar, against other lenders that have a relationship with the debtor. With a blockchain, it would provide more uniformity to a uniform system. It would provide in a, a, a very direct manner where every state in the union, this is my dream, is that every state in the union uses the same technology, the same youth search logic, the same way to output information that everyone in the world can see that provides the inquiry notice that is contemplated by the UCC system. And so every Secretary of State could utilize the same type of blockchain technology that says, if you want to know if there's been a filing in Pennsylvania, Wyoming, Delaware, wherever, you can search here and it's just another field in the blockchain that shows where was the filing, what was it with the appropriate body or not, What's the name of the debtor? All of that would be on an individual block. Each filing would create an individual block on the chain that shows that a UCC has been filed. And so, to me, any state can go first. Why not us? It hasn't happened yet. And to me, it seems like it's a very inexpensive investigation and implementation for a, a, one of the more simple systems that is administered by this Commonwealth. That's why I like the UCC as an example, and I happen to know something about how that system functions. No, I appreciate the answer and appreciate your time here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Ortita. I'd like to welcome Representative Fitzgerald and 
House State Government Committee Minority Chair Representative Conklin to the hearing this morning. Turn it over to Representative Ryan for questions. Thank you so much for being here. I, I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. The um, in any type of I, I, I'm an expert in bankruptcy. I prior to becoming a representative, I'm a CPA, and your applications and comments relative to the UCC are particularly appropriate. But one of the questions I'd have is with blockchain and and my limited experience in in the legislature in just five years is that sometimes we're behind the power curve. Uh, and as an example, if blockchain, and it is an innovative database technology, it's not the last technology. Uh, and so the question I would have for you is, what are some of the vulnerabilities uh, to a blockchain technology? How can a governmental entity that would structure legislation not inadvertently create an incentive for someone to abandon this technology and develop a different type of a te technology, that type of thing. And then finally, what type of implications are, are there to a, uh, an electromagnetic pulse attack? I'm a retired Marine as well. Okay. And an EMP type attack that might possibly potentially interfere with items stored electronically. Um. I'll, I'll answer them in order. Uh, the, the, your first question, were, what are some of the things that you should be thinking about, is the way I took your question. It is. Um, and so if I were in your shoes, if I were on the other side of this, um, this hearing, the things that I would be concerned about are you know, the don't fix what isn't broken issue. So our systems work, so why do it? And so th it also raises questions about security, you know, who has control of the data, is it, is it going to get compromised? Is it going to be modified? Can people, you know, who has the ability to modify the chain? Um, one of the reasons why so many parties are, are moving to this type of technology, and I, I referenced just a handful of the ones that I'm familiar with, um, I think the Italian olive oil one's a very interesting one because there's a lot of import-export, a lot of different producers, and from an auditing standpoint, they have found that the, it, the blockchain technology, because it's so finalized and so permanent, and so searchable and quickly searchable that it's it's much easier to, to track what's going on. So there, you know, are the taxes being collected properly, for example? Um, so the security is an issue. I think it's critical for any governmental body that implements any of this technology to do their due diligence on how the actual blockchain functions that gets selected through what would typically be an RFP process or something like that. Who who is the provider? How is it designed? How is it secure? Why did El Salvador select Algorand to be the platform for Bitcoin, for example? You know, their entire economy is th now accepts a legal tender that's run on a blockchain technology by Algorand. So what if there's an attack? What if there's a cyber attack? What if there's a breakdown in the system? How, how do you have continuous ongoing operations at all times? And those are all fair questions and all things that should be thoroughly investigated. And why I, I mentioned in my, my statement that I'm not here to suggest a, an imp implementation protocol. It's just a first step to start asking these questions. What, what could hold us back if we do this conversion? You know, a, a lifetime ago, I was a systems analyst at a, a steel company. And at least at that time, any system that you would implement, at that, we were converting to web-based technologies at that time. Any system had to be run in parallel. You know, the steel mill still got to make the steel. It has to have the data on site in a localized manner. And then you want to be able to ship things to third parties and they want to be able to see it. Well, there was an old system through General Electric that point to point how you get the information. Well, we should go to the web. That's the next step. Everybody has access to it. It's very inexpensive. You don't pay a fee to a third party to just have the point to point discussions. And so we ran the system in parallel for months. Fly spec it, check, you know, did this one work? What's the same outcome? Is it identical? You know, you, you have to figure out your batches. So to me, it's going to require investigation on the platform that's selected. How is it secure? How does it have continuous operations? How do you have control of the data? Who, can, who has access to modify that data? And then when you select a system, pick one that is easy to compare in parallel to see how it gets rolled out. And then from there, at some point, you can flip a switch and go to the, go to the one that is I would, I would suspect that through investigation you'll find is less expensive, is carbon negative, are the things that matter from a technologist standpoint, which is how do you save money from it? 
How do you improve and enhance the operations of the Commonwealth? And I think this technology, based on what others in the marketplace are doing, are finding that it is the, it is the solution in some regard to enhance your systems, make them faster, make them more secure, make them more transparent, and make them more efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ryan. Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Price. I appreciate your testimony. I, uh, you have said in your testimony that uh, the technology more or less was created 50 years ago that is used today in all the various systems. Um, and you are highlighting the blockchain as an option to move forward. So I would like to hear from you, since the current system basically works, it's been vetted through many years, what are the advantages, the specific advantages of moving to a blockchain methodology? So from, from what I've reviewed and seen, um, the, the, the use case is largely on efficiency, cost, it's less expensive to administer, it's less expensive to manage and maintain, and it is more transparent and easier to, to search and, and get data output. Um, so it's, I, I can't put a number to as to what exactly it would save the Commonwealth in funds or um, how the carbon neutrality or negative nature is compared to the existing systems, and I think that's what I'm asking for is an investigation to look at certain systems. What does it cost the Commonwealth to maintain it? How, how does it run? And based on other use cases that are happening every day, there's something else comes out using some different form of blockchain technology. They have announced that the reason they're doing it are the things like transparency, speed, efficiency, car carbon neutrality, or less. Um, so I just, I think that any party, including the Commonwealth and private parties, should be reviewing their systems to see, is this something that can save us money, be more efficient, be more transparent for whatever our purposes are? And so I think gov a government entity, not surprisingly, manages massive systems, um, no different than private enterprise. So to me, it's, it, those are the, the basic pluses of, of investigating it. I've yet to find too many negatives with it. I, there, it, it does seem to hold up, and, it's, and this is not new. Blockchain technology is, call it seven, eight years old as far as being heavily used by private industry. And we're starting to see sovereign nations do things with it, which what sp spurred my interest in saying, well, why not a state level? Why not look at what a state could do with it, uh, whether it be for, you know, I, I referenced three different ones where there's, um, you know, for cryptocurrency, El Salvador is using it for, for a backbone to administer uh, legal tender. For Italy, they're, they're using it for um, ensuring that there's proper tracking on all of their olive oil uh, transactions. And for Nigeria, um, very much akin to a UCC system, uh, there's now a partnership that they've launched that's gonna be on blockchain for all intellectual property filings, all registrations that are done. And so we're talking about nations that have significant financial constraints and issues, and they're finding that they, th they can save money from it and have more robust systems, and it, it is an evolution of the technology. The tech, it's, there's, there's sea changes in every industry, and technology has, is starting to recognize that blockchain is a sea change. Some people refer to it as Web3. There's different things that you'll see buzzwords out there, but it really is um, a seismic shift in how people are managing their data. And I just think that it's something that um, this Commonwealth should investigate as to whether or not it's something that they should use as well. I have a, another question. Uh, we had a hearing just yesterday, and one of the issues, without going into detail, was we talked about was how our policymakers often lags technology. And it's difficult because of how the public process works for us to move forward in the same pace. So one of the questions I have related to the previous question about security. This area of uh, blockchain is so highly complex and the question I have is how, how do we as government officials look to secure that in light of the fact there's very, very few individuals that fully understand it? And if some individual out there has written the code, then some individual knows the individual parts and how to access it and so forth. How do we as a government body that is constantly changing secure that? So you're touching on the, the, the concept that um, 
many, many in, in the, the digital asset arena have tried to solve what's referred to as the trilemma. The, how do you create a platform that involves data that is uh, secure, can scale, can, can as big as many transactions as you need, and be, and be fast, have finality quickly? So people focus a tremendous amount on the, the, the currency aspect of it because you want to be able to transfer funds just as quickly as you could on the Visa network, which is, has finality within seconds and is secure. And is, it is tried and true. It works. Um, so how do you do that with, with this new technology? And it, it, it depends on the schematic. It depends on how that network that maintains that blockchain is run. And you have to, that's part of the investigation, is understanding how are they solving the trilemma? How are they doing things that ensure that it, it is secure and it can handle our scale and it is, it is efficient, it has quick finality. And so there's different ways of doing it. There's dozens of blockchain platforms out there. They refer to themselves as layer ones. They, it's, it's by which all the information flows and then layer two are applications on top of it and other networks that function with it. So when you're looking at these layer one technologies that have these blockchains, you, the, the questions are not only fair, they're, they're mandatory. How is it secure? Who controls the data? How do I know that bad actors can't manipulate it? How do I know that you, at all times, it, it can't go down? Why can't it go down? Explain that to me. How does that work? How do, I, how do I have total comfort that you can deal with the amount of data that we're gonna produce, that you're gonna be able to do it 24-7, 365, it's never gonna go down, and how do I know that it's secure? And who has the keys to the kingdom? Who has the, the, the keys to that data? And I, I leave it to you know, a, a further and deeper investigation I'd be happy to help with to investigate how do we ensure that it gets done, that saves us money, that is secure, that won't go down, and those are all fair questions. Final question here for now, anyway. Uh, we, during the, uh, our, some of our previous hearings, discuss election security and that sort of thing. So the question I have has to do with uh, two concepts. One, open source, so that everyone can look in on it and kind of be the gatekeepers. Everyone's checking everyone else of what's happening. And then the closed source. So in terms of blockchain, uh, is, is what you're describing here open source or closed source? Uh, for security purposes? At your option, it, as I understand it. So typically, uh, parties select to, to use the public blockchain that's out there, but you can certainly have one designed for yourself that's closed. So those are the sorts of things for implementation that you know, companies and, and, and governments should look at. Should, should all this data just be out there? And for, for governmental entities, I think a lot of people would say, well, it should. It's, it's a governmental entity. It should be completely transparent. But the question is, who has, from a security standpoint, who has the ability to change or alter the information? And, and if you look at the way certain blockchains are designed, there's validators on, on blocks. And, and those validators are the ones that say that this should be added to the chain. So how does that work? Is it automated? Who, who can manipulate that? Who can be involved in that process of manipulating a block? And when I, I actually, when I met with um, Representative Ortitai uh, directly, I, I said, I'm gonna really try to avoid you know, politicized issues like, like voting systems, for example. Um, but it is fair to, to raise the question of, well, if voting was, was on the blockchain and scannable, uh, it's, the Auditor General should love it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tremendous amount of information that's easily scanned, and it gives data output that shows what happened, and including you know, how the block got validated and, and, how it, and who approved it. And so all those sorts of things, you, you, just, you have to understand how that chain works and if it's the right fit for your organization, whether it's a governmental entity or it's a private entity. So who can see it, who can touch it, who can scan it, who can change it, and Every entity is going to have to make their choices as to whether they want it transparent, whether they want it to be just visible to certain authorities. All those sorts of things are, are, are pivots for every different system that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Miller. Chairman Grove. Thank you. You know, uh, we, we, have our, we have our issues with implementing new technology in this Commonwealth. Um, I remember wonderful breaking stories about our wonderful um, 
emergency management system, um, unemployment compensation system, which still, um, I'm not sure is fully operational after we're putting hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money in that. So um, it's a question whether state agencies can actually implement big change. Um, so I don't foresee us shifting to blockchain right away, but I think it's important to start discussing it. Um, I care deeply about stopping fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, I have a disdain for improper payments, and this Commonwealth makes billions of dollars of improper payments. Um, you know, nationally, I think it's $163 billion of welfare fraud, um, which started with the federal government um, removing all um, integrity provisions within the UC system, and it trailed to states like ours, um, and we continue to see it. Um, you know, my, my, a lot of, actually all of our district offices were treated as the intake center by labor and industry uh, during the pandemic, um, of which I had, I had couples. One applied for unemployment, wasn't getting it. The spouse got unemployment, never applied for it. It was a constant frustration. Um, so I'm glad you brought up the UC system as uh, maybe a form to, to work through this. So if we were to take the UC system, um, Representative, which, not, not, sorry to interrupt, but are you referring to the unemployment compensation system? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Unemployment that's comp. Yep, yep. Sorry. Government terms, right? UC. Yeah. No, it's it's okay because yeah. I, I my I spoke uh, quite a bit about the uniform commercial code system. So I just want to make sure we're talking about two different right. systems. Yeah. That's fine. So if if the state would implement this, um, and let's let's just use unemployment compensation for an example, because we know how much fraud, waste, and abuse, and how many improper payments occur through that system, um, would would each individual filer have their own chain or would the entire system be a chain? It's a single system okay. um, that, so for example, there, there's a layer one system that exists. We can, we can take, um, I've spoken about Algorand. Algorand exists. That blockchain is used for various different registers of information. And so, as I mentioned, it's being utilized to, to run the Bitcoin system in El Salvador. It's also now gonna be used to run the Nigerian intellectual property system, um, filing registration system. Um, the Pennsylvania unemployment compensation system could be yet another one that that chain, you can use the information, and within there, there's, it's sprinkled all over the place, but the way the system works, you can, you can query it, and it'll output that information and show you for this specific system, this is the relevant information and data. So if I'm going to audit that information and say, who got payments, it's very similar to traditional database management, but it's on a broader public chain. So it's transparent, it's easily searchable. So you can do a private subset of that developed by a vendor like Algorand that says, we're gonna create the Pennsylvania governmental chain as I, from what I understand, and again, I'm not an expert on this stuff, right. but I just keep seeing partnerships announced, private industry announcing that we're doing a, we're doing a private chain, we're gonna do, inf utilizing this technology, so I'm not sure how that procurement works if you wanted to make it just purely the only data on it is Pennsylvania specific. Um, typically, you're seeing that it's just being utilized on the broader chain. Right, for citizens going into the UC system, mm -hmm. you know, I go online, I wanna file, None of that changes, correct? It wouldn't have to. Right, so you're basically talking about the data management aspects of it, that you're using less server space, um, and your data, all your data is not sitting on one server, it's spread out across a chain. Correct. Right? So if I'm going to penetrate the system, I need the key card, correct? Or the, the, the password or whatever, the, the to access it. That is that is the important aspect of the blockchain where on a server system there might be several points to penetrate um, that server and get into the database. It's fair. Yeah. Know, yeah. yeah, that's fair. Okay. Um, so conceivably it'll stop to an extent maybe a little more of individuals trying to hack into governmental systems. It'll make it harder to do that um, as long as you protect your, your kind of passwords, correct? Well, one of the things that I've seen in um, commentary mm -hmm. about um, 
the crypto, cryptocurrency space, the, the blockchain space, is that, um, and, and a fear that's raised by, um, more on the federal level, because there's discussions about digital assets right now, is the, the amount of fraud that goes on in the digital asset space. Um, you know, faceless individuals are, are, are you know, doing various things to, to take, you know, off your ledger onto mine, put it into my wallet. Um, so I can't say that there, it, it, it shuts down concepts of fraud or, or abuse or waste or things like that by, by individual actors that try to game the system, but the, the data integrity, the security and the scalability is something that I, I, I do believe is a technological advancement that should be explored. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that it would change um, necessarily somebody saying, I'm entitled to unemployment benefits, but they really are not. They can still file, mm -hmm. um, and but now on a blockchain, you can see that they did file and they did get benefits. You still have to have the intervention to say, well, were they actually entitled to them? Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Grove. Chairman King. Thank you, Chairwoman, and uh, thank you for uh, your testimony this morning. Uh, I'm just going to let you know I am in deep, deep water here, so I'm going to try to uh, navigate through this. Uh, I felt better this, when somebody said they knew about bankruptcy because that's what I do every trade, day. So we're, we're a little bit out of my leg here, but you've already touched on, you know, uh, cybersecurity, which is extremely important. And it's uh, something that I've seen hit an organization that I was affiliated with and they were held hostage. So I do know uh, that's probably on the top of my list there, but you've already addressed that. You already addressed the unemployment compensation, which was going to be my next one. And, and now I'm into what are the disadvantages of blockchain? So the disadvantages as I see them is the unknown. You know, the, uh, being a first mover in anything means that you're, you're everybody else's tackling dummy. You know, you, you, you're gonna have to go through the process and get it right to make sure that it, it gets it right. Um, my, my position on that is that there's already been a lot of implementation in large-scale large systems, sovereign nations, et cetera. So that's, that, is, that, that concern is reducing daily, from my perspective. Um, the, the other disadvantage is um, it requires a shift over on how data is managed by the Commonwealth, and there's gonna be a learning curve um, for, you know, the general services to understand how to manage that, and um, in all likelihood, there'll, there'll be a, a shift in the vendors that they have to use to implement it appropriately. Um, so, anything that involves change, there's, there's the downside is the, the transitional period and the costs associated with it, um, and the the use case and cost benefit analysis that is actually going to work. So, all of that right now, um, I can't sit here today and say that other states have done this and it was all okay. I, they haven't done it. So it's, it's, um, that's, my neg that's the negative that I can identify, is the unknown, you know, will it work? Um, but there's a, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that is proving out that this technology can be functional for large-scale systems. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fascinating technology, so thank you for being here today. Well, thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Chairman Kane. And if I could follow up on that question, um, we had an issue with our unemployment compensation system where um, somehow rogue actors were able to enter into people's unemployment compensation accounts online and change the bank routing numbers. And those bank routing numbers were then changed to um, these rogue actors' bank account numbers and people's unemployment compensation benefits were then directed into this other person's account, right? And I know that in your testimony that you provided to us here today, you said you're not here to talk about cryptocurrency. However, when uh, people trade in cryptocurrency, they also often have um, a blockchain wallet mm -hmm. to keep all of their assets safe, and they, have a cryptographic key in order to access um, that blockchain wallet. <clears throat> so help me to understand, I um, have a person who is now unemployed. They're going to get unemployment compensation for the first time. Mm -hmm. So we have a blockchain system in place. Um, 
what type of credentials um, would they need in order to access their blockchain unemployment compensation account? Would they need to have some sort of a cryptographic key? So, um, <clears throat> Senator, the goal of all of these systems, in my, from my perspective, is that the user interface doesn't have to change at all. So the end user, the citizens that are applying for unemployment compensations, the citizens that are, or the, the parties that need to file UCC filings, um, the interface can be identical as to it is today, as to how you put the information in that gets loaded to the blockchain as opposed to the servers that you maintain. And so John Smith is entitled to unemployment compensation benefits. If that's now permissible on the on web, so if they can just go on to online and, and file with their name, their information, their, their prior employer, um, and, and all the information that gets uploaded to the unemployment compensation system, my, what, I'm, what I believe is would be the, the shift would be instead of going into a server that's maintained, whether it's an Oracle type database or how, whatever the Commonwealth uses, um, or SAP or something like that, mm -hmm. that information would go into the blockchain that then the Commonwealth or anybody else could, could search to see that John Smith applied for unemployment compensation benefits and they are available at certain rates because they'll be, the system still has to exist to show, okay, they're in this quadrant for these types of benefits for this long. And there would be a block created to, to memorialize that those benefits exist. Now, to move into the concepts of tokenization, currencies, et cetera, you could, that block gets created, you could also mint a, a, a token that says, here is your, your, your personal right to get that benefit, John Smith, and it's issued by the state, and it's, a, it's an NFT, and it has his name, it has the number, and all. all those things can be done now, here, now, and today. The, the, the tricky part is actually administering the payments through some form of currency. We don't currently have a U.S. digital asset. There's no USD token backed by the Fed. So you can't right now give them a wallet uh, that, that holds and gets U.S. dollars in it, for example. That's not ha that has not happened yet. So you're saying that the blockchain technology is being used on the back end to assure that John Smith is in fact John Smith, that John Smith's bank account is in fact John Smith's bank account. You're not talking about it being on the front end of how that money is dispensed Correct. into that person's bank account. Money's the tricky part <clears throat> right now. Okay. So But I but I also you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I also no, no, go ahead. I, one thing I wanted to <laughs> add to that though is that um, I think it's important to know that the permanence of those records that goes to the security questions. The 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 validation that John Smith is, is actually filed that the, the concept of third-party hackers, you have to investigate whether or not the blockchain has the ability to ensure that those, those, those blocks can't be modified, that you can't change that John Smith's mailing address is what went from this to this to, to effectuate a fraud. But at some point, John Smith may move from Maple Street to uh, Main Street. Yeah. And so um, what would a process look like for John Smith to make any potential changes to his information to assure that it, John Smith has in fact moved from Maple Street to Main Street. How, however, the UC, the unemployment compensation system functions for, for change of address or change of name, somebody gets married or, or gets divorced and changes their right. name back, all those sorts of things as they exist today could still be maintained and they create an additional block. Another block gets made, so now John Smith, and you can correlate it, just like there's a filing number for the unemployment compensation the first time, you know, you're John Smith's the first one to ever file for unemployment comp. He's number one. Well, number one now correlates to block number 15, which is just a mailing address change for John Smith from the block one. It's, you have now two blocks that exist, and because it's very inexpensive to administer, you can make billions of blocks. And, they, and so it matters about the point-to-point -point correlation between those blocks, that they relate to the same social security number in all likelihood, or you know, f uh, federal EIN for a, corpora for a corporation. Um, those blocks, that permanence, is why it becomes more secure, that third parties can't come in and modify and say, well, John Smith's really now over here, and, and it's not really John Smith. 
and they wouldn't need any type of cryptographic key that could potentially be lost in order to access their benefits. They could just use their, their password because you know we have people who lose their passwords, who um, need to change their passwords. Um, we hear in the cryptocurrency world where you lose your cryptographic key, you lose all of your assets. That would be potentially problematic for everyday Pennsylvanians. So, so my statement said, you know, I, I, I'm skirting the cryptocurrency aspect because I, I, I personally want the Commonwealth to focus on what they can digest right now. The, the Commonwealth switching to some kind of cryptocurrency or, or issuing a token that is recognized by the state to do X, Y, or Z is a much more challenging endeavor. But I'm happy to talk talk about what cryptocurrency is, that the issues you're discussing are real. They're, they are a real issue in cryptocurrency, and the reason that they are real is that it comes down to the security that they're trying to give end users. So generally, this is how it works. So let's say you and I have a discussion afterwards and say, hey, I want to get a wallet. I want to hold some cryptocurrency. You can do that on one of two ways. You can hold it on a centralized exchange. The most common one that people are aware of is called Coinbase. So you, can, you and I could create a, an online web interface, fill out your information, has know your customer information requirements, referred to as KYC. So they, they, you actually have to take a picture of yourself, picture of your driver's license. So they know who you are, and it's centralized. That's on a database that, that Coinbase maintains. They know who you are. They report to the federal government that you did X, Y, and Z, and, the, and they give you tax reports. Uh, you know, what did you make? What did you lose? That is a username, a password, and if you're really smart, you get uh, dual authentication. You know, you have a you know Google Authenticator or something, so somebody can't get into it. And you can hold Bitcoin in that, you can hold Ethereum in that, you can hold Algorand in that, you can hold Dogecoin in that. You can have tokens that are fungible tokens. Again, there, there's so many of them issued, and they're treated as currency, an exchange of value. I'll give you ten of these, you'll give me this back, cash, U.S. dollars, etc. There's an exchange that's centralized. <clears throat> The keys that you're hearing about is when people say, I don't want to hold through a custodian. I don't want to hold my currency through a third party intermediary like Coinbase or Crypto.com. I want to hold my tokens in my shoebox in my house. I, don't, I want them in my digital shoebox under my bed. That's the wallets that people are talking about. It's a wallet that gets created on chain that shows all the information so we could download a wallet. A wallet is an application that has to be developed to war interface with a blockchain. So that wallet gets created, and they give you 24 or 25 words that only you should know. And if, and if you get concerned that your, your phone's been compromised, or that you, the, you know, that you took a picture of it and saved it in your phone and somebody you know, with, with some kind of malware went in and found your, that picture, they now have the keys to your wallet. And they can be on any number of different platforms and say, move these tokens that are in this wallet with this key, move them over here now. And, and, and sometimes they're successful. The FBI can sometimes get the money back, the cryptocurrency back, and oftentimes they're not. That's a very different issue, and why I, I said it, it creates a bit of a Pandora's box of discussion, but it's a very different issue about what I'm talking about with blockchain technology be used for these types of systems where you're just, instead of having this database that you pay for and you maintain, you have the blockchain that does that for you, and then you have these applications that you have to build, like the application that has the wallet that stuffs the information into it that says, this blockchain authenticates that it's associated with this account, in this wallet held out of a centralized exchange, in my hand, in my wallet, in my phone. Or, but really, just memorialized on the blockchain permanently. I can rekey anytime I want to. I could pull my phone out right now and say, you know what, I'm getting concerned that while I was doing this testimony, I became publicly known as a figure. I talked about Algorand, he probably has a bunch of algo or some other thing that's on that chain. I'm gonna go download and try to f get into his phone and find out what his keys are. So when I leave here, if I get concerned that you know, now people are maliciously attacking me from a, for my digital assets, I can go into my phone and rekey it and only I know it. So that, that is an entire realm of, of how end users you know, protect their own data. That's, that's their own inquiry of how am I secure, just like you should be about the Commonwealth's data. How's my data secure versus how your data is secure? And I appreciate 
that that point is is very very salient to all the members who are sitting up here today. Mm -hmm. That is our ultimate concern, of course, and making sure that, um, especially with unemployment compensation, that the money is actually getting to the right person. Right. So, um, really appreciate you delineating that. Um, you acknowledge that this blockchain technology it is ever evolving. So in your opinion, what are the challenges for ever evolving technologies on a government level? So um, the technology is evolving rapidly. And there are, as I mentioned, there are different chains available. And so as a, as a government, I think it's, it's critical in the selection of the chain. The chain that, if, if you were to go in this direction, which chain you use. And one of the reasons why I became most interested in, in Algorand um, over other chains as a solution is I, I listened to uh, a variety of podcasts by different thought leaders on um, this technology. And there's, there's Ethereum is very well known. Um, there's, you know, Algorand was highlighted by a podcaster um, by the name of Lex Friedman. Lex Friedman interviewed uh, the inventor of Algorand, Sylvia McCauley, for hours and talked in, in detail about how he and why he created the Algorand blockchain. And he's not a nobody. He's, he's a professor at MIT. He's, he's, con he's considered a thought leader on the, the backbone of blockchain technology. And, and I'm, su I'm summarizing a very high level of, as to what he said, and I, I could never really digest everything that he put in into those three hours of discussion. But in essence, what he said was, it, some people did some interesting stuff. They created these blockchains and they work, but they have flaws. They're, they're, they're not perfect. So I could try to evolve what already existed and take what was created and, and, and improve it and enhance it and make it better. Or I could start from scratch knowing what I've known from these prior ones and create something, as he uses the term elegant, it's more elegant and it works more, more appropriately. And I think it's now to a point where there's chains like Algorand that are ISO compliant, that have been tire kicked by you know, certain standards of organizations, that if you look at it, there's now, the evolution has happened long enough that organizations like this, bodies like this, should look at it because a lot of the flaws of the prior systems that there's constant patchwork. The whole existence of layer two, for example, is that there are flaws and issues with the Ethereum network. As an example, what are those flaws? They refer to them as gas fees. A gas fee is every transaction costs something. You have to, you have to pay something for the transaction to go through. Oftentimes, the transaction fee exceeds the value of the item that's being transferred. That's completely illogical. So layer two technologies, because of those flaws, are created to try to deal with those transactional costs. You look at the newer technologies that have come out since, and what the newer technologies, the transaction fees are less than a penny. That they've, they've, they've solved those issues. So I just, I, it's, this is not something that came out yesterday. Over the course of years, there's been analysis and scrutiny of the existing ones that were done early, and there's even been an evolution on that with brand new standalone technologies that have improved and enhanced and dealt with the cost aspect, the carbon ne negative aspect, the, the transactional fee aspect. The, and and the, the carbon issue is a real one where you know, people criticize uh, Bitcoin and things like that with mining because the, the energy digestion is significant. Thank you no very much. And I, so for me, if there was one thing that you would want to, um, us to know uh, once you leave here today about blockchain technology and its impact on government operations, what would it be and why? I, would, um, I hope the takeaway is that this is something that can greatly benefit the Commonwealth from a, from a cost standpoint, transparency standpoint, security standpoint, and that um, appropriate diligence is necessary to do it right, but it's something that can be done and should be done in the long term for some or all of the systems that the Commonwealth administers. 
I think that pretty much wraps it all up. Okay. Mr. Price, I want to thank you so much for, for being here today. I want to thank all of the members who have joined us for what I think was a very informative and very enlightening conversation. And as much as we learned, we know that there's even more um, that we need to learn and, and delve into and really, again, appreciate your testimony here today. Um, and with that, I would like to recess this hearing until the call of the chair. Thank you very much.